Well, good evening. Nice to see you today. I'm glad that you are with us this evening. Um, just to let you know, there are no handouts tonight, but there will be handouts again next week, okay? So for those of you who are looking for them and wondering where they're at, they're coming back next week when we get into really our uh, verse-by-verse exposition study of 2 Corinthians. So if you want to take your copy of God's Word, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Uh, tonight we're just going to do kind of what we did a few weeks ago before I started preaching through Romans, an overview of 2 Corinthians. Uh, there's a saying, and you've heard it before, you might have even said it, you can't judge a book by its cover. What does that mean? It simply means this, that you cannot judge based on appearances the content or really the significance of the, 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 what's in between the cover, I guess, of the book. And so, really, there is a temptation, humanly speaking, to be deceived by appearances. Uh, We tend to look at the outside. Remember when David was being selected, what happened? Uh, Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And so, there was something going on years ago, many, many years ago, within the church at Corinth, in which people were being tempted to look at appearances and being deceived by appearances, and so we can't escape appearances. That's just the reality of life. But what's beneath the surface is what really matters. This is the point that Paul made in 2 Corinthians. Now, I love 2 Corinthians. There there are uh, many books of the Bible that I, I really, really, really enjoy reading. There are some books in the Bible that because it's God's Word, I treasure and I value, but it's a little tougher to read. You know what I'm saying? Leviticus, a little, little challenging to work your way through, right? Deuteronomy, a little challenging sometimes to work your way through. Uh, but 2 Corinthians, I, I really appreciate and enjoy 2 Corinthians because it is almost as, uh, it serves as almost a, an autobiography of the Apostle Paul. He gets very personal in this letter to the church at Corinth. It's probably the third letter that he wrote to Corinth. We don't know what happened to uh, the one between the first and the second, but, um, or first and third, but second Corinthians is most likely the third letter that he wrote to them. And uh, he was dealing with really this issue that God's kingdom isn't made visible by strength and success. Rather, by, rather God's kingdom is the kingdom of the weak. You can't judge a book by its cover. And that goes against, again, human tendencies. And so to get into this letter, let me start with just a little bit of background. Corinth was an important city, massive city. Both land and sea traffic came through the city of Corinth, making it one of the major commercial and philosophical centers of the first century in the Mediterranean area. And after writing 1 Corinthians, Paul had actually intended to visit uh, Corinth. But he was really in no hurry to leave the profitable work that was going on in Ephesus. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 9. So what did he do? He sent Timothy to bring a report on how the church responded to his letter. And so Timothy arrived and he found chaos and disarray in the church. 1 Corinthians did not seem to accomplish what Paul by the Holy Spirit, desired in the church. And so upon hearing of the church's condition, Paul set out for Corinth, a visit that he had warned them of in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 21. He also said in that text that it would be a painful visit if he had to make that visit. And during his stay, some self-appointed leaders of the church who may have called themselves apostles attacked him in, in deeply insulting ways. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, verse number 10, and again in chapter 7, verse number 12. And apparently, Paul felt this visit to be a complete fiasco, and so he left. And hoping that his departure would bring the Corinthians to their senses, this decision left him open to the charges of being both fickle and uncaring. But Paul wasn't necessarily ready at that time to let the gospel witness of this church be smothered. And so he wrote yet another letter out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears as he described in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 4. Now this letter is the one that I referred to before. It has not survived. It was delivered evidently by Titus and it assures the Corinthians of his love for them, but also he had stern words of rebuke directed to them. And despite all of the turmoil in the church, Paul actually asked Titus, uh, tasked Titus with receiving a collection from the Corinthians for the impoverished church in Jerusalem. 
Meanwhile, Paul left Ephesus after a riot broke out, went to Macedonia to, Macedonia to wait for Titus, and he was afraid that his severe letter to the Corinthians might have hurt them too deeply. But Titus then came back, and he brought a good report. And his concern for the church at Corinth actually turned to joy. So look with me in chapter 7, verse number 8, and you'll see what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 8. We are going to be all over 2 Corinthians tonight. So be prepared to turn and read along with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved unto repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. In this two verses, in these, in these verses, you see really a human reaction from Paul, don't you? He, he's writing to them and he was afraid that he might have wounded them too deeply, that his words might have stung just a little bit. But then after he heard the report from Titus, he realized, okay, that's exactly what they needed it was actually good for them to receive that stern rebuke. They received it, and they repented, and they changed. There comes a time in almost every pastor's life and ministry where he has to issue stern words, where he has to say things that he knows are going to wound the people that are hearing them. It's not fun. I've only known a few who probably enjoy it. Most don't. But the reality is, it is one of the more loving things that a faithful shepherd can do to rebuke believers who are erring and pursuing sinful actions and lifestyles in the hopes that they receive the rebuke and turn, they repent. But it's not just pastors who have to do this. Faithful believers, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ will often rebuke a, another brother or sister who is living in sin and in error. And sometimes that rebuke has to be somewhat sharp. Yes, it's it's speaking the truth, it's with love, but it stings. Why? Because salt in a wound stings. And if the salt loses its savior, what good is it? Savor, what good is it, right? And so faithful believers have to hold brothers and sisters accountable. And the hope is, the goal is that even when you issue a stinging rebuke, that the person who has been rebuked will turn, listen, and change course. That's exactly what happened in Paul's situation with the church at Corinth. That's what he's saying in chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. So in response to this good news from Titus, Paul then penned 2 Corinthians about a year or so after he wrote 1 Corinthians, probably around 56 AD. And, and the way the, the text breaks out in the first nine chapters, you can really feel his joy at a healed relationship that had been severed, that had been um, really destroyed to some extent, but also his relief that the worst for the Corinthian church really seems to be over. If you know anything about 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the church is an absolute mess. It is what we would call today in, in today's vernacular a dumpster fire, right? It is an absolute mess. From the get-go, Paul is just addressing Issue after issue after issue after issue. They didn't get it, so he wrote a harsh letter. Now he finds out, okay, they, they're doing better. And so he has joy. He expresses joy at this healed relationship. The church had repented, and it appears from chapter 2, verse number 6, that an opponent of the gospel may have been disciplined by the church. But before sending the letter, Paul must have received some more disturbing news from Corinth. It seems that once again, the so-called super apostles 
were challenging his authority and ultimately the gospel. And as a result, 2 Corinthians ends with more strong rebukes. So the first nine chapters, man, things are good. You get into the last few chapters, now Paul is rebuking them again. Paul is warning them again. Now that you know the background, let me summarize a bit about why Paul wrote the letter. Uh, Paul wrote the second epistle, the second letter to the Corinthians, for the, per, for the public, personal, and practical, for the following pub, personal, uh, I can't talk tonight, public, personal, and practical reasons. See, Paul was so concerned about the public conduct of some of the Christians in the, in the church that he wrote to explain really some key doctrines of the faith better and then to give instruction and warning to some of the members of the church. Paul was also personally criticized, and so he wrote to defend his ministry. He wrote to defend his apostolic authority. He wrote to defend his personal integrity, and he had practical concerns for the church in Jerusalem as well. So he wrote to solicit funds for the relief project that was going on among believers in Jerusalem. And so Paul addressed all three of these concerns through his main message really about the kingdom of God. According to Paul, the kingdom, you hear that word a lot, the kingdom is not about us exerting our own personal strength, but in weakness depending upon the Lord. As Jesus told Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So those who would be deceived by Paul's opponents because of their apparent strength missed the true nature of the kingdom. So for the rest of our time together tonight, what I want to do is just consider what characterizes the kingdom according to 2 Corinthians. Specifically, I want to point out three themes uh, about the true nature of the kingdom that really run through this letter. First of all, if you're taking notes, this is the first theme. Kingdom apostles display God's power in weakness. Kingdom apostles display God's power in weakness. So the Corinthian church needed weak apostles like Paul, not so-called self-described super apostles. So the defense of Paul's apostleship really takes up a large part of the book, including most of the first six chapters and then chapters 10, 11, and 12. And so Paul did not do this because he was a self-promoting egotist. He, he was defending himself because in being drawn away from Paul, the Corinthians were actually being drawn toward those who are egotistical those who did not have the apostolic commission from Jesus that Paul had. They claimed to be apostles, but they were not truly, genuinely apostles. And so those who were opposed to Paul were taking advantage of three aspects of Paul's apostleship that they believed made Paul untrustworthy. They said this about Paul. He's unstable. He's unstable. How did they come up with that? What, what drove them to make that accusation? Well, well, Paul had planned to visit the Corinthians again, but in the end decided not to. And so his critics were claiming that this was because he was unstable. He was fickle. He couldn't make up his mind. I'm going to come to you, no, I'm not. I'm going to come to you, no, I'm not. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. And Paul explains this as he begins to defend himself. He says, Why, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? What's Paul getting at there? He explains that, that once he had realized that there was real problems, that there were real problems with the church at Corinth, a quick friendly visit would not have been appropriate, and a quick stern visit would not have been kind or encouraging. So he thought it would be better for the Corinthians, far better for the Corinthians, if he did not visit until things had been cleared up. Turn to chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. He explains again. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. I didn't want to come and wound you. I sent the letter. He was trusting that the Holy Spirit would work through that letter. Ultimately, he wanted things to clear up before he came back. So the first accusation, Paul was fickle. He was unstable. The second was Paul was harsh. 
Not only was Paul supposedly fickle, but secondly, his critics accused him of being too harsh. They pointed to the severe letter that Paul had written about a matter of discipline. The church seems to have misunderstood the letter, thinking that the discipline was to be permanent, but Paul encouraged them in chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, to be reconciled with the brother who had sinned and now repented. Look at it with me, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For whom? The repenting brother. So they said Paul was harsh. Another thing they said, accused him of, charge that was leveled, was Paul lacked credentials. That Paul had none of the letters of recommendation from other communities that other itinerant preachers in the time would have used to to prove that they were the real thing. There's a problem with that. There's a reason why he didn't have letters commending him from other communities. Most people in the other communities wanted to kill him by the time he was done preaching the gospel there. They drove him out. And so Paul, for his part, he insisted that worldly commendation has no place really in Christian ministry. Where does he make that point? Look at chapter 3, verse number 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Far better than recommendation letters, the, the faith of the Corinthian people showed that Paul's ministry had been blessed by God. Most significantly, Paul's major defense of his apostleship came not through responding to petty accusations, but simply through living out a positive vision of the ministry of an apostle, which he had carried out faithfully. While while the the self-styled super-apostles had fallen short. And this really provides one of the clearest, most valuable sections of teaching on church leadership in the entire Bible. Because in these verses, Paul showed us not only what makes a true apostle, but also what sort of ministry our own church should pray and strive for. And here are a few things that Paul taught us about Christian ministry and how it displays God's power in our weakness. He said the the glory of the ministry is the glory of the gospel not the glory of human appreciation. Look in chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to bring God, or to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak Christ. In other words... Proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ is glorious, regardless of whether people reject it or embrace it. It doesn't matter. So many people today, they they only want to preach or teach if they have a big crowd. They're not interested in preaching and teaching to 5, 10, 15 people. They, 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 They want the the chairs filled. They want to preach before the masses. And you know, when I was younger, that seemed really, really important to me. And God, by His grace, never gave me the opportunity to do it. When I started in teaching ministry, the first place I ever taught was the Clinton County Adult Daycare. It was the only place that I had made available to me to teach. The church I was serving in at the time uh, was a little over 500 people, was growing leaps and bounds, and uh, I went and asked the pastor if I could preach some Sunday because he let the staff preach. 
not frequently, but, you know, regularly, somewhat regularly. And so all the other staff guys got to preach. I was the music guy, right? And I'm like, preacher, I want to preach. And he's like, no. I'm like, okay. Um, well, can I, can I teach a Sunday school class? No. Okay. So in staff meeting one day, he's like, hey, people from the Clinton County Adult Daycare called. They're looking for somebody to go down once a month and, and preach and teach the, the people there at the Adult Daycare Center. I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he's like, you sure you want to do that, Keller? I'm like, yes, I will do it. So I went down there and I, I taught at the Clinton County Adult Daycare Center. And there were not very many people there. And the people that were there weren't paying a lick of attention to anything, right? <laughs> and uh, they, they didn't know if I was there or not, really. It was an interesting situation. But I got the chance to do that. And, and that's, that's where God gave me a start in teaching and preaching, where I he was able to, to show me that I, I had a, an ability to do this that I did not know that I possessed, but that he had given to me. And from there, I went to a, I guess, a, a medium-sized church up in Allen Park, Michigan, and took a ministry. You know, my first Sunday teaching young adults there or young married couples, we had 11, including me and my wife in that class. And the next week we had nine, and the next week we had six. I was doing great, you know what I'm saying? But it was through those times of just continually to faith, continuing to faithfully preach and teach the Word that God began to teach me, you know what, it doesn't matter how many people are here, just faithfully feed them. And that's what essentially Paul is getting at here. It doesn't matter how many people. You don't do it for human acclaim, you don't do it for human appreciation. Now, I'm always thankful when people are thankful for, for the ministry that I have. I'm thankful when people are thankful for the ministry that the, the staff here has. I'm thankful that you're thankful, and I'm always humbled when appreciation is shown. But the reality is none of us are doing it for human appreciation. We're doing it because God has given us the opportunity to do it. I was talking to Pastor Nate today, and I, we were just talking about different things, and I said, can you imagine that, that God in his grace lets us do this for a living? What a cool thing is that? And God is gracious to us in allowing us to do this, and so the, proclaiming the message that the gospel of Jesus Christ is glorious, regardless of whether people reject it or embrace it, regardless of how many people are there or not. That leads to the second thing. Power for this ministry doesn't come from human ability, but from God's grace. Look at chapter 4, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, verses 4 through 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The power for this ministry, Paul is saying, doesn't come from my ability, from, from my skill, from my knowledge, from anything that I have learned or attained. The power for ministry comes from God's grace. It was true for Paul. It's true for every person who has been in any kind of ministry, period. And when I say that, I'm not just saying that the ones who stand up here on Sunday morning, I'm talking about the ones who stand in classrooms and teach children on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. It's the ones who uh, take care of babies in the nursery who are screaming their heads off. It's the people who open doors and clean toilets. It's, it's whoever is doing anything in ministry. It is the power of God that gives you the enablement to do that, not anything in and of yourself. Which then leads us to the next thing. The focus of the ministry is not the messenger, but the subject of his message. And the subject of a faithful messenger is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. 
For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The focus of the ministry is not the messenger, but the subject of the message, Jesus Christ. Therefore, the concern of kingdom ministry is the heart not outward appearances. I've said this time and time again, and and it's really part of the focus of our children's ministries. We are not interested in making your children more moral. We're not interested necessarily in behavioral transformation, modification. No, no, no. We want to focus the ministry of the Word on the heart of the hearer so that there is a change, but it originates on the inside and manifests itself on the outside. Behavioral modification is easy. Actual real transformation is a work of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verses 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. It's not about outward appearances. The agent of the kingdom, Paul says, is the ministry, or the agent of kingdom ministry is God. Chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. We are only ambassadors. God is the one who reconciles sinners to himself using the message of the gospel. The result of kingdom ministry is changed lives. Turn to chapter 6. Look at verse number 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Chapter 7, verse number 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Brothers and sisters, this is what the ministry of weak apostles looks like. It is not about outward appearances, but spiritual realities. The the reality of God glorifying himself by showering grace upon undeserving, weak sinners like you and me. And Paul solidified his case toward the end of the letter. In chapters 10, 11, and 12, apparently Paul's opponents believed that if a teacher was popular and successful and lived a life of good fortune, then of course his message must be true. How can anybody driving a Beamer be wrong, right? How can anybody flying their private jet be wrong, right? Paul, in contrast, seemed like a real loser. He was always getting beaten up. He was put in prison. He was literally chased out of cities by angry mobs. So can't you almost hear the super apostles make fun of him? What a failure. Who would listen to somebody who suffers so greatly? Maybe he's cursed, not blessed, of God. For their part, the super apostles would pile up lists of all of the achievements and qualifications that they hoped would then impress their audience. And I'm sure to a degree it did impress their audience. Paul engaged in the same type of argumentation In these last chapters, he amassed a giant pool of evidence, citing example after example after example to make his case. Except in Paul's situation, everything that he listed is utterly 
unimpressive. He didn't talk about his private jet. He didn't talk about his multiple cars. He didn't talk about his mansion that he lived in. He didn't talk about uh, all the money that he had in the bank. He didn't talk about the the millions and millions of dollars that uh, had been given to him and, and, and invested into his ministry. Here is how Paul lists his evidence. Turn to chapter 11. Look at verse number 24. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." From pain to sickness to shipwrecks to persecution to the famous thorn in the flesh, Paul's resume was a catalog of weakness. He's boasting, but he's boasting like a fool from the world's eyes because he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And this is a good question to consider. Do we value the same things the world values? Should we choose a church because we like the pastor's speaking voice when he preaches? Do we choose a church because we like his educational pedigree? Well, this pastor has these letters after his name, therefore he's qualified. For the majority of my life in ministry, I had no letters after my name. Was I unqualified? No. Do we marvel at a pastor's people skills? Or do we choose a church based primarily on the message being preached, even if the preacher himself is unimpressive? Paul is telling us not to put any credence into appearances, but instead to look for the work of the Spirit in changed hearts. Now, I hope you see how this might inform us as to how we can and must pray for our elders. God has given us good elders. He's blessed us with good, godly men to shepherd this church. And so let's let's pray for them. Not to trust in worldly wisdom, money, or impressive, achieve, uh, or impressive achievements, but consider all of that absolutely worthless compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Because that is what matters most. That's what you need from the men God has tasked with leading you, shepherding you, feeding you. Pray that they would instead teach with wisdom, not that comes from the world, but that comes only from Him. See, the the weakness of the kingdom is demonstrated in Paul's apparent deficiencies compared to that of the super apostles, but that's not all. It's also demonstrated by the true citizens of the kingdom. That brings us really to the second theme that we see in this book. The citizens of the kingdom display God's generosity in weakness. The citizens of the kingdom display God's generosity in weakness. 
We see this theme in Paul's instructions about the collection for the church in Jerusalem. The meeting that Paul was earlier unable to make with Titus, he has now made in the account of this meeting in chapter 7, if you want to turn there, verses 5 through 16, they actually serve as a link for the Corinthians' restored fellowship with Paul. And so Paul heard the good news from Titus and sent Titus back to collect funds for the believers in Jerusalem who were suffering extreme poverty. And so the significance of this collection is not limited to first century Corinth because it tells us something about what citizens of God's kingdom are like. Turn to chapter 8. Look with me in verse number 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you might by his poverty become rich. The exhortation to give is really a test of whether the Corinthians have truly grasped Paul's teaching about the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is built on the sacrificial generosity of Jesus Christ. And so these believers had a responsibility and they had a glorious opportunity to serve their brothers and sisters in need. And so we, we see, and, and we've already kind of looked at the, the idea that the central truth of Christianity is the weakness of those in God's kingdom. And of course, one of the most common weaknesses, both in the time of Corinth and today, is poverty. So in providing for the Jerusalem Christians who were poor and evidently weak, the Corinthians would be fighting against the ever-present temptation to use the money that they had in ways that would mainly strengthen them, strengthen their financial position, strengthen their comfort in the world. And Paul called them to give, and in so doing, he made a spiritual, he called on them to make a spiritual investment. And so how do you approach giving to other Christians in need? Do we welcome opportunities to sacrifice what we have? What would it look like for us to be characterized by the heart that Paul says the Macedonians ex ex exhibited? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse number 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, talking about the impoverished Macedonians, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Does this type of attitude characterize us today? Are we the kind of people who give even beyond our ability to give? Typically, we will give according to our ability. How often do we give beyond it? And when you hear something like that, you're thinking, well, that's just foolishness. Why would you give beyond your ability? That doesn't make any sense. Do we give only when it's comfortable? Do we give only to whom we really want to give? One of the things that Paul stresses in this theme is that generosity is an attitude that comes from God's grace and that giving is actually a fruit of our faith in Christ. Where there is strong faith, there will be a generous heart. And where there's a generous heart, there's always tangible generosity. So instead of trusting our money for ultimate security, true citizens of the kingdom trust God's sovereign care over his children. And so the, the book teaches us that a healthy church is one that responds to others' needs to spread the gospel and to build up believers. And so those who participate in this grace should do so cheerfully and liberally. Why? Because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look with me there. Verses 7 and 8, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Do you see and hear the definite language that Paul used there? So the second theme is the weakness of the kingdom citizens. The last theme runs through this letter, and it's 
really the result of such weakness in our churches. The church of the kingdom displays God's grace. The churches of the kingdom display God's grace in weakness. One of the things that I love about First or Second Corinthians is the fact that throughout this letter, Paul stressed the importance of the church. I, I am convinced that so many believers really have no clue how important, how vital the church is. That it is not something that we simply attend, but it is something that is, we are connected to that God uses in a formative way in our lives. And so Paul taught throughout Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, that the church is where God dwells. Now, please understand, not in a building. The church is not the building. The building is the building. It's made of tangible materials, right? But God dwells in a temple not made with hands. And so God dwells in his church, God's people. And therefore, Christians are called to holiness. Now, that is a word that causes the hair on the people, back of people's necks to stand up sometime. Oh, no, you're talking about holiness. Here we go again. Legalism, holiness, legalism. It's like it, people just make a direct line from holiness to legalism, and that's, that's not an, a real or accurate equation. Look at chapter 6. Verse number 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. The church is where God's presence rests. Therefore, it displays God's glory to the whole universe. Now, what does that mean for us as a local church? Well, Paul identifies really a few passions that should characterize us as a church body. One of them is something we've already talked about extensively, a passion for weakness. One aspect of this letter that you cannot ignore is Paul's passion to exalt God in his ministry. And one of the great ways that that he does this is by demonstrating God's strength in accomplishing great things through Paul's weakness, not his strength. We've already seen Paul continually refers to his own sufferings. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. Chapter 11, verses 16 through 29. Chapter 12, 1 through 10. And he does so with a joy that seems somewhat alien to our comfort-seeking ears. Because he boasts about these weaknesses as they give glory to God. But Paul also makes sure to, to communicate this reality to us, that, that we also are described as weak. Paul describes our bodies as jars of clay in chapter 4, verse number 7. Why? Because of their frailty. But it's precisely, precisely in our brokenness that God reveals his strength. This is why Paul exalts in God even in his limitations, even in his difficulties. Chapter 12, turn there with me. This is probably one of the most famous sections in 2 Corinthians. Many of you have probably even memorized this. Three times, verse number 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. What's he talking about? This thorn in the flesh that he dealt with day in and day out. But he, meaning Christ, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What's Paul's response to that? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. For what purpose? so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness. I am content with insults. I am content with hardships. I am content with persecutions. I am content with calamities. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. What about you? When suffering comes into your life, do you see it as an opportunity for God's power to be displayed to the world? Or do you indulge in self-pity? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Right? Nobody knows my sorrow. So much trouble. So hard. Life is so hard. Life is hard. Life certainly isn't fair. But for the believer, for those who are in Christ, God takes all of these things so that his power might be displayed not through our strength, but in our weakness. We can learn from Paul to thank God for circumstances that humble us. We can learn from Paul to thank God for circumstances that cause us to depend upon and rely more and more upon God's grace and less and less upon our strength. Have you ever thought about how a trial in your life could be used by God to make his glory known to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers? Listen to what a former pastor says about this passage. He said, quote, The closer we get to the Lord, the longer we walk with him, the more fully we understand his word, the more we are gripped with our weakness, inability, and sin. Paul said that he would boast all the more gladly about his weakness. It was not because he loved being weak, but because it was a weakness that the power of Christ, it was in that weakness that the power of Christ rested on him. Our weakness will not get in the way of what the Lord wants to do with us. Our delusions of strength will. The power of God is for the weak. The grace of God is for the unable. The promises of God are for the faint. The wisdom of God is for the foolish. The first passion that we should char- that should characterize churches of the kingdom is that we pursue, we're passionate for weakness. Why? Because weakness ultimately reveals the sufficiency of Christ. The second thing is a passion for the gospel. Paul's ministry had been under attack. His authority was questioned by these super apostles. And so in response, he highlighted in this letter the true gospel because by reminding the Corinthians of this central message of forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ, he would expose his opponents as false teachers who had failed to grasp the reality of God's grace. This means the priority of the gospel should be evident in our church, especially in the preaching The gospel is what Paul preached, and it is why he preached. Like Paul, we preach Christ Jesus as Lord. Chapter 4, verse number 5. Because we are the Lord's ambassadors. Look at chapter 5 with me. Look at verse number 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Drop down to verse number 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us 
to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, coming to a verse we already referenced, we are ambassadors, representatives for Christ, God making his appeal. How? Through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Verse 21 is one of the most compact summaries of the gospel in the entire Bible. Before a holy God, every human being stands guilty because of our sin. Sin deserves punishment. Jesus Christ, however, the eternal Son of God, was sinless. He deserved no judgment. But out of love, Jesus stepped into our place, and he took the punishment that we earned, dying on the cross. Jesus then rose again, offering the gift of life, his perfect righteousness to all who would turn from self and sin and believe in him. This message of Christ being a substitute in our place, being sin for us, bearing God's punishment was central to the health of the Corinthian church. And it's central to the health of Crosspoint Church. And so we should pray that this good news will never become stale to us. That when you hear myself or one of the other pastors of the church or any other teacher of the church give you once again the the basic tenets of the gospel. You don't roll your eyes and think, oh, there's the gospel again. I'm already saved. I don't need to hear this. Yes, you do. Because it reminds you of what you were saved from and the price that was paid to purchase your salvation. We need the Holy Spirit to ignite within us a passion for the gospel because remembering it will protect us from the sorts of false teaching that entice the Corinthians. And so a church passionate about the gospel is also careful to refute false gospels that do not preach the biblical Jesus. And there are a lot of them out there. That's why Paul declared his intention to, in chapter number 11... What I am doing, I will continue to do. In order to, under, in order to undermine, chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And such is the passion of a god driven gospel ministry. It's passionate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a third thing. That's a passion for repentance. In 2 Corinthians, we see that there should be a passion for repentance in the church. What does repentance mean? It simply means that turning away from sin, turning to God. And so Paul is overjoyed in the news that Titus brings him that the Corinthians have turned away from their prior sin. He's eager for them to continue on the path of repentance. Look at chapter 7 with me. Again, I read to you the first part of this. For even if, verse number 8, I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though for only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. The type of church Paul is in, 
encouraging is first and foremost concerned with godliness. It is not concerned with prominence or perceived success. However, it is primarily concerned with seeing the body of Christ built up and one day presented to God spotless and without wrinkle. Therefore, we have we who have tasted God's grace in saving us from our sins should pray for a passion to continue repenting of our evil ways and relying on the love of Christ in faith. And so that's 2 Corinthians. Let me ask you, do you see any of yourself in the Corinthians? They certainly weren't the greatest role models. But it's amazing to think that this church, this ignorant, boastful, immoral, undiscerning church, this church was chosen by God to glorify himself in the city of Corinth and around the world. Paul told them in a dream, or God told Paul in a dream in Acts 18, the Corinthian believers were the people whom he had chosen. Let me show you. Acts chapter 18. Look at verses 9 and 10. God said to Paul, The Lord said to Paul, one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. These were also the people that Paul poured so much of his heart soul and sweat and tears into during his short ministry here on earth. And if we don't get anything else from this letter, then let us understand this. The church is never promised to be perfect on earth. If you're looking for a perfect church, guess what? You're not going to find one. It doesn't exist. If anything... As Paul reminds us, the church is made up of those who are apparently weak and foolish and insignificant in this world. But our weakness is the soil where God's power makes real fruit grow to his glory. And we follow a Savior who modeled just that. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, for he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. And so those who hope in the resurrection of Jesus, they, they trust God as he works to transform them from selfish, cranky, impatient, weak people like us into his glorious and radiant bride. And so Paul ends with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I hope you're looking forward to 2 Corinthians. It is going to be a lot of fun. It's also going to be very challenging to us. And whenever we get through it, and I'm not in a hurry, it will take as long as, long as we need for this one. That's the beauty of Wednesday nights, right? We're just going to take as long as we need to take. And uh, we're going to work our way through this, and by God's grace, he will work in our lives through 2 Corinthians. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for giving us your word. Father, I ask that as we endeavor to study, that you would 
guide and direct, and that you would bless, Father, that you would give us eyes of understanding, Lord, that we would glory in the weakness that's so predominant in our lives that your power might be made known and seen. So, Father, I praise you and ask you to work in us, for I pray it in Christ's name, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here this evening.